Hi everyone, my name is Dr Jess Carniel. I'm Senior Lecturer in Humanities here at the University of Southern Queensland in the School of Humanities and Communications. Before we get started, I'd like to first acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which I am speaking, the Gaibal and Jarawa people, but also the traditional custodians of the lands on which you are all gathered, as well as their elders past, present and emerging. Today I'm going to be talking to you about environmental movements since the 1960s. Environmental issues in the past are just as pressing as they are today, but the responses change over time. And importantly today, we need to have responses to these environmental issues that aren't just scientific. We need to understand the environment within various social, political and cultural contexts. And the solutions that we find might actually be a little bit more human oriented. My lecture today will be in three parts. In the first part, we're going to think broadly about the relationship that humans have had with the environment over time. This is broadly what we, what we call environmental history, but we'll delve a little bit more into the underlying philosophies as well. In the second part, we'll look at a specific case study, that is the Franklin Dam campaign of the 1980s. This changed the landscape of politics and the environment in Australia. And in our final part, I'll answer some of the questions that you sent in to us. So in this first part, we'll be exploring the question of what is the human relationship to the environment and how has this changed over time? You might want to take a moment here to jot down a couple of ideas, a few words or sentences that summarise your thoughts on this matter. This is the question that underpins environmental history as an area of study. What is our relationship with the environment and how has it changed over time? How have humans interacted with the environment over time? And what role has it played in human relations, such as culture and politics? And what role have human relations played in affecting the environment? But first, maybe let's ask an even more fundamental question. What is the environment? The term environment refers to various surroundings, settings and systems. This can be referring to the physical or ecological sense of the environment, but it's also important to think of the use of the environment to refer to the built environment or the social sense of our environment. The environment is also a set of resources. These can be resources that we're competing for with other groups, such as the same food source. Environmental ethicist John Benson describes the environment simply as a global system that which all living beings share. This definition emphasises social relations within space. Even though we might believe that the environment has intrinsic worth, that is, that it has value in and of itself regardless of how we value it or how we want to use it, it is something that humans inhabit and that we share both with each other and other non-human animals and other biological creatures. Our knowledge of the environment is something that is built through familiarity, observation and understanding. This gives it all meaning, but that meaning changes over time. Early religions, for example, focused on natural phenomena such as the sun, the moon, trees, storms, but also human relationships with nature, such as goddesses of the hunt. So it's predominantly about an idea of nature and the environment as a resource that can be used by humans that has fueled the, the rise of environmental movements and rethinking this relationship between humans and the environment and whether or not we should just be thinking about it just as a resource. Broadly speaking, social movements are collections of community groups with similar areas of concern who argue for fundamental social change. These movements are important to understand historically because of their effects on public discourses, politics, social organisation and even popular culture. The problem for social movements is how to influence the political structure. They're usually a large minority whose power is the moral force of their arguments. Social movements arise in response to a particular social problem. 
Their first task is usually to educate the community about the issue or the predicament and to provo provide uh, or propose alternatives. If the problem becomes dire, membership of community groups, groups increase as more people seek to become more involved to solve the problem. They also use symbolic actions and protests to draw attention to the issues and to help publicise their cause. As community groups, their resources are usually limited and they have to seek novel ways of attracting media interest. When legal and political channels are blocked, they also sometimes resort to direct action to prevent or hinder the practices they believe are harmful. Their ultimate aim is to make contact with political power, whether that's through the parliament, administration or the legal system, in order to resolve the problem or the issue. Once the problem is resolved, or if the system can't or won't deal with their issues, social movements usually degenerate as members become demoralised and withdraw. The environmental movement is a subset of social movements in the same way as the women's labour and peace movements of the past. Like these movements, which are also ongoing, the origins can be found in the 19th century. For example, early concerns about the human impact on the environment began to be voiced in response to the effects of industrialisation. The rapid growth of the manufacturing industries as well as coal-based transportation saw an increase in pollutants in the name of economic growth. Some, such as English philosopher John Stuart Mill, argued that economic growth should not come at the cost of nature, especially if that growth was not guaranteeing a better or happier society. It was not. Pollution was a major source of health problems in Victorian England, leading to some of the first environment-related health reforms. Similar concerns prompted reform in the United States in the 1960s, with a focus on chemical impacts. Improved chemical pesticides had been developed as a result of military research in World War II, including research retrieved from researchers in the Axis, such as Germany and Japan. Pesticides became prevalent in post-war agriculture, so much so that American biologist Rachel Carson published her pivotal work, Silent Spring, in 1962. It was first serialised in The New Yorker and then went on to be a bestseller as a book. Silent Spring documents the harmful effects of the use of pesticides in farming, specifically DDT which harmed organisms other than their intended targets, such as birds and even people. In the opening pages, Carson poetically imagines a spring without birds, a spring that is silent because of the lack of birdsong. While Carson was criticised as an alarmist, the work did prompt an investigation into pesticides by the Kennedy administration, which resulted in regulation of their use. Sadly, Carson died of breast cancer before she was able to see these regulations in place. The counterculture movement of the 1960s and 1970s undoubtedly influenced the growth of environmentalism throughout those decades, eventually moving beyond the local or the national into a more global movement. Greenpeace, for example, was officially founded in 1969 in Canada, but its reach was global by the end of the 1970s. One of the important shifts that occurs in the 1970s is more philosophical than political. This was the rise of the deep ecology movement. This is a movement, this is a movement towards a more biocentric thinking about the environment. That is one that puts the environment at the center of thinking rather than humans at the center of thinking, which is what we call anthropocentric. Sorry, anthropocentric. It's a really difficult word to say. <laughs> now, as you can imagine, this is not a widespread ideological shift, as we might argue even today, the discursive pro focus or the way that we talk about the environment is still focused on humans and the way that we use it, rather than the environment as the centre of our concern. What we also see happening in the 1970s is not just these grassroots popular movements, but increasing attention paid to environmental issues on the global stage. 
The United Nations, for example, established its environmental program as early as 1972. And the first Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, was held in 1988. International summits and agreements such as the Kyoto Protocol, the Copenhagen Summit and the Paris Agreement are now a regular part of the international relations calendar. What this highlights is a recognition of environmental issues as being important for thinking about such things as global human security and human rights and the need for a global response. We now turn to the second part of this lecture, where we're going to be focusing in on the Franklin Dam. This is a really useful case study for exploring how environmental issues increased in importance on the Australian political agenda throughout the 1970s and 1980s. It also charts the rise of the Green Movement in Australia and the eventual development of one of the current political parties, the Australian Greens. So without exaggeration, it can be characterised as a campaign that changed the Australian political landscape. We start, however, not with the Franklin Dam, but with Lake Pedder. Lake Pedder was a very unusual mountain lake in southwest Tasmania, with a rare sandy beach and unique fauna. The image that I have on the slide here shows you Lake Pedder before the changes that were wrought to it. The Australian Labor Party was in office in Tasmania and when Gough Whitlam was elected Prime Minister in 1972, he instructed his Environment Minister to stay out of Tasmania. Lake Pedder was put under uh, for inundation, so to turn it into a dam. Although people lobbied, all forms of those lobbies failed. The young people who had joined the movement to help save Lake Pedder were devastated by the lack of militancy amongst the leadership in the face of this tragic defeat. As the shores of Lake Pedder were being drowned, they looked, took over at the annual general meetings to oust the leadership of old organisations and to set up new groups to make sure the environment movement would never give in so easily again. One group was the Tasmanian Wilderness Society. The image here on the slide is by photographer Peter Dombrovskis, titled Morning Mist, Rock Island Bend, Franklin River. It played a pivotal role in the visual politics of the Franklin Dam campaign. The Wilderness Society took out a whole page ads in national newspapers featuring this image with the provocation, could you vote for a party who would destroy this? The image is replicated in the campaign posters and also appears on the cover of Drew Hutton and Libby Connor's History of the Environmental Movement in Australia. It provides us with an opportunity to think about the role that provo um, provocative and evocative images can play in prompting public dis debate and discussion about important social and political issues. What is an issue that interests you and what kind of imagery would you use to get people interested in that issue? In the late 1970s, the Tasmanian government geared up for a new struggle over the wild and beautiful southwest Tasmania region. The powerful Hydroelectric Commission wanted to dam the Franklin River. It refused to debate the need for the dam, so under intense political pressure, the Tasmanian government held a referendum to decide where the dam should be located to try to diffuse public anger over the issue. There was no option to vote against having the dam. The environment movement urged voters to write no dams in southwest Tasmania on their ballot papers, and 40% of Tasmanians did so. At the same time, the Tasmanian Wilderness Society set up offices in the mainland to educate all Australians, not just Tasmanians, about the issues and the beauties of the Southwest that seemed about to be lost forever. They also lobbied the federal government. Malcolm Fraser, who was Prime Minister at the time, offered the Tasmanian government federal funding to build a conventional coal-fired power station but was not prepared to use federal powers to override the state. When the state government still refused to change its position on the issue, 
the environment movement began planning for a non-violent civil disobedience campaign in the middle of the southwest wilderness. In December 1982 to January 1983, the environment movement attempted to blockade the Franklin River to prevent the HEC bulldozers from reaching the dam site upriver. Thousands of protesters were arrested, including Dr. Bob Brown, the leader of their campaign, and eventually the founding leader of the Australian Greens. The blockade is significant because it demonstrated the power of popular protest, but federal politics still played an important role. A federal election was set for March 1983. The new leader of the ALP, Bob Hawke, promised that a Labor government would use federal powers to protect the river. The environment, advocate, the environment movement advocated a vote for the ALP and environment supporters handed out how to vote cards for the ALP around the country. Bob Hawke won in a landslide. The southwest region was declared a World Heritage Area and Hawke argued that Australia, as a signatory to the International Covenant on World Heritage, he had a duty to protect the area. The Grey government in Tasmania appealed to the High Court. In a landmark decision, the judges of the High Court voted four to three in favour of the federal government's power to intervene. As, and the reason for this is because World Heritage was an international obligation that Australia had to uphold. The Franklin River was saved. In 1987, the environment movement again urged a vote for Labor when Bob Hawke's government promised to use its World Heritage powers to protect the Daintree Wet Tropics. The Queensland government was supporting a property developer who had cut a road through the rainforest that was causing massive erosion and being used to open access to the region, which had no infrastructure to support residential development. By the 1990s, the fortunes of the federal ALP government were not looking good. There had already been leadership tensions between Hawke and his deputy and treasurer, Paul Keating. Hawke was looking for an historic fourth term as a Labor Prime Minister when his Environment Minister and Numbers Man, Graham Richardson, promised to protect Stage 3 of the Kakadu National Park and thereby limit mining in the park's conservation zone. As in the Daintree, environmentalists had been drawing media attention to the plight of the region with a blockade, this time of the existing mine. Richardson's promises again convinced the environment movement to support a vote for Labor publicly, and environment supporters campaigned for the ALP in marginal seats to get Hawke over the line. In 1991, sections of the Green movement gave up on the strategy of influencing the ALP and formed a Green Party, with which the five Green independents in Tasmania and two Green Western Australian senators were affiliated. Bob Brown, the man who led the Franklin campaign, won a seat as a Green Independent in 1983 and was joined by another in 1986. By 1991, there were five Green Independents and this is the foundation of that party that emerges in the 1990s. So this starts to paint a picture of the political landscape in Australia that might be a little bit more familiar to you today. The Australian Greens are now a fairly established political party, although their platforms have expanded considerably beyond just environmental issues to broadly represent left of centre politics in Australia today. Environmental issues continue to be a pressing issue nationally and internationally, affected by the ongoing pressures of global capitalist economics. While a scientific approach is needed for the development of such things as sustainable energy and resource management, social movements are needed to influence people's and government's thinking about and understanding of environmental issues and to address the important social effects of environmental decline, such as social justice and humanitarian issues related to human security. In this final part of the lecture, I'll answer some of the questions that were sent forward by you. We have one big question from St. Teresa's Catholic College in Nooseville, which is, what works by which histor environmental historians would I recommend to you to read? I'm going to start with Libby Connor's historical overview of the environment movement in Australia, written also with Drew Hutton. I mentioned Libby first and foremost, as she just recently retired as a professor in history here at University of Southern Queensland. 
Now, this is very much a traditional Australian history that's linked strongly to understanding the movement as it connects to politics and social change. It highlights the way the Australian environment has been an ongoing interest and concern for settler Australians. The first national parks, for example, were established as early as the 19th century. The book also charts the rise of environmentalism in the latter part of the 20th century. It's perhaps one of the best historical overviews of environmentalism in Australia, keeping in mind, however, that it was published in 1999, so it doesn't capture the history of the movement in Australia in the past 20 years, nor how our national relationship with the environment may have changed in that time, with increasing concern over climate change, mining, drought, and the decline of the Great Barrier Reef. We might also want to pay attention to the cover image that's used on this book here. It's that same image that was used in the Franklin Dam campaign. My next recommendation for your reading list highlights the need to think critically about Indigenous and non-Indigenous perspectives and approaches to environmental issues. This is Unstable Relations. It critically assesses the idea of green-black relations, that is, the assumption of environmentalist indigeneity, which can essentialise Indigenous Australians in the discussion. This book also examines the role that the environment plays in articulating post-colonial relations today. Now, this is what we call an edited collection. So while um, Hutton and Connor's book was written just by those two authors, this is a collection of chapters and essays written by a variety of different authors, including various activists, historians, geographers and anthropologists. So they've got a lot of different perspectives in terms of how they look at these issues. So it's a good source to give you a multifaceted perspective on environmental issues with a consideration for our post-colonial context. My next recommendation is Michael Cathcart's The Water Dreamers. Now, this was based on Cathcart's PhD thesis, which was a history of water in Australia, or rather of our relationship to water and how it shaped Australian history. Cathcart argues that Australia was settled by Europeans with a preoccupation for the scarcity of water. You can see the evidence of that today with around 85% of the Australian population being found and living on the coastal areas. Cathcart points out, however, that, and I quote, though the country is dry, Australia has more water per person than any other continent. By that measure, we are not running short of water, yet many rivers and catchments are in crisis. Our problem is not an excess of people, but a lack of understanding. We are still getting it wrong, he says. Cathcart's perspective is not dissimilar to that put forward by Margaret Cook in her recent book, River with a City Problem. Now, this might also be of interest to you as an environmental history located here in Queensland. Its title demonstrates more of an ecocentric eco perspective in that Cook suggests that it is not the Brisbane River that has been a problem for humans who have settled on it, but rather that the humans who have settled on the Brisbane River have been a problem for that river. So this is an interesting perspective to apply to environmental issues more broadly. Is the environment a problem for us or are we a problem for the environment? What happens to the way that we think about solutions when we take this sort of perspective? I'm going to end my presentation just with a slide that looks at the sources that I've used. So I've focused here on the images. So one of the ways that I tend to approach things is through what we call visual politics, and I also like looking at popular culture. So those are the kinds of sources that I use in constructing my research and my presentations. They also look really good, so that tends to be helpful as well. One of the great resources that you can use is the National Library of Australia, which has searchable databases where you can find newspapers from a very long period of time, as well as photographs that have been uh, donated by people. So the image of the blockade there is an example of a donated photograph.
People also collect things like those campaign flyers and donate those to the library. You can access a lot of these images electronically through those databases and through that construct really interesting analyses with source-based evidence uh, that you can use to explore some of these environmental issues. It's not just limited to things like the Franklin Dam campaign, but a whole variety of different environmental and other social movements that have occur occurred throughout Australian history. So thank you very much for your time. If you have any other questions about environmental or social movements since the 1960s, just send us an email and we'd be more than happy to help you out.